And joining us now in studio, Birgitta Jonsdotter. She is the Icelandic Member of Parliament and former member of WikiLeaks. And we are happy to welcome you to Canada and to our studio as well. Very can, happy to be here. Can you tell us, first of all, Birgitta, how did you get involved with WikiLeaks to begin with? Well, in uh, 1st of uh, December 2009, uh, we were all speaking at a seminar at the Reykjavik University for the Digital Freedom Society. They were speaking about uh, Julian Assange and Daniel Smith, who were speaking about uh, Transparency Haven. Uh, I was relatively new to the Icelandic Parliament. I've been uh, an activist for freedom of information um, and various other things. You're a poet. And a poet. You've written poetry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you got elected. You're what, one of four who got elected with 7% of the vote a couple of years ago? So yes. it's a relatively new thing for you. So Absolutely. you saw him and. Uh, Daniel Smith, uh, and I felt, because I've noticed that uh, the freedom of information online is gradually being chipped away from us, uh, and I'm concerned about it, and I felt that uh, most countries are behind when it comes to making laws for the internet, because uh, there is most of the legislation for freedom of information in the world is based on legislation from the 17th century. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so, so we need to modernize our laws. Uh, and. Uh, why not make a holistic approach to it? So use the tools of uh, the corporate world for the freedom of information movement and uh, journalists. Okay, and through the release of this classified material, as you have done, or as WikiLeaks has done uh, on a few occasions, what are you trying to accomplish? Well, I think it is very, very important that there is some place in the world, hopefully many more than WikiLeaks, where you as a source can leak your uh, information uh, if you're a witness to a cr criminal activity, be it in the corporate world or the military world, uh, without uh, the threat of being persecuted. And I find it to be very unsettling what is occurring right now, how US authorities and some others are trying to criminalize whistleblowing and criminalize the middleman that is providing the raw documents. So when you say criminalizing the middleman, they're not going after the New York Times for publishing or any of the other media, they're going after you, and you find that unfair. Is that right? Absolutely. Uh, and I think. Uh, if they manage to do this, then all the rest of the media should be very concerned about their own uh, ability to publish. And they're already in such trouble to publish stories. There are so many prior restraints. And uh, I, I don't know how it is here in Canada. I've heard various stories that the situation is quite grim here when it comes to prior restraints. Uh, and people have suffered here from liable tourism in the UK and so forth. I think um, it's very important that we realize that we are only getting a portion of the stories published. Let me uh, move to, I, I guess, one of the more controversial things that WikiLeaks was involved with, and this is um, last April, the release of that classified video from the U.S. Apache helicopter in Iraq. This took place in 2007. We're going to roll some pictures of it as we speak here. Um, its release helped turn WikiLeaks into a household name. And I wondered if you could let us in on some of the discussions that took place behind the scenes among the WikiLeaf, uh, WikiLeak, um, you don't call them staff members, what do you call them, volunteers or members or whatever, into how you decided to release that video. Well, WikiLeaks uh, used to, when I was involved with it, uh, be quite an organic sort of process of people moving in and out, uh, just depending on what uh, was needed at each given time. So when we decided to uh, actually bring in the mainstream media and produce this, uh, like pr find out, uh, do fact checking, send people off to Baghdad uh, through the Icelandic uh, state television. Um, we sort of, it was a sort of a different process than uh, what WikiLeaks had done before. Basically, they only published the uh, raw documents. They never did anything with it. So it was an experiment. Uh, and it has fundamentally changed WikiLeaks. Um, I remember when we first, when I first saw the video, um, I was determined to help with it because I felt it was so important to lend the voice to the voiceless, the people that you could actually, you knew the families of the people that were killed in the video and everybody that's trying to tell about war crimes, but they never get their voices to be heard. This came off the internet. It's a quote and I want to read it to you and give you a chance to react to it. Uh, the writer says, I agree that WikiLeaks should exist. There needs to be an independent group out there that allows the little man, the insider, the oppressed, to upload and share the information. However, they should not be taking sides on these issues. They need to be impartial. Collateral murder, the video, is far from impartial. 
They've passed judgment, edited video, held press conferences decrying the soldiers and the government. They need to be impartial if they're going to be respected. Get the information out there, yes, but allow others to pass the judgments. What would you say to people like this who think that you're not simply pushing transparency, you're actually pushing a more political agenda? I, I agree. I totally agree with this statement. Uh, and uh, at the time when the decision of the, ma the name of this um, video or this project was decided, I, I did actually not agree with it because I felt that a lot of focus would go on the name instead of the content. Who decided the name? Uh, Julian Assange and a couple of others. There were others that did not like it also because it's difficult to spell for people who don't have English as the first language. Mm. Um, so, but I, and I think maybe we also have to look at WikiLeaks as um, an experiment uh, and the activist that pushes the boundaries of uh, so that others can go a little bit further with their material. So Does they, that mean from time to time they get it wrong? We all do things from time to time wrong. There are, you know, yes, but when some people make mistakes, the consequences are not that significant. When WikiLeaks makes mistakes, the consequences can be dire. Do you think that's the case today? Uh, no. I, I, I haven't seen anybody um, or any proof of anybody having been put into danger or being killed because of the material provided by WikiLeaks. It, however, has revealed uh, a staggering amount of uh, war crimes, uh, a staggering amount of uh, questionable uh, diplomatic uh, activities. Uh, and I think it's important to put into perspective none has been killed because of the WikiLeaks leaks. However, very many people have died in Afghanistan, uh, very many civilians, very many unreported civilians, uh, and also in Iraq. I think that's well. I think what you say, as far as it goes, is accurate. But I think you're, the critics of WikiLeaks would say, a, nobody's died yet, and b, there has been some fairly clear identifying information about formerly secret sources that came out in WikiLeaks. That if these people aren't dead yet, it certainly puts their lives in danger. Would you agree with that? Um, I, I think that uh, with the Afghan war logs, there ha should have been more. Um work put into making sure that no names would be uh, trackable. Uh, and I think that they actually learned from their mistake by making sure that such was not the case with the Iraq war logs. Okay. Uh, I, I know transparency obviously is a big deal for you and you're trying to bring the sunshine in. <laughs> uh, I wonder though whether or not by doing it this way it may have a perverse effect. Namely that if every diplomat in the world now thinks their name and their position and their private conversations are going to be uh, no longer private, then everybody can see them, that the effect of this will be to push genuine diplomacy deeply underground, not documented, and have the exact opposite impact that you want to have. Are you worried about that? Not yet. I haven't seen any proof of it yet. Uh, I, I think that uh, it's very important. Like, Of course, there are some things that should be secret. However, uh, there are way too many things that are secret today. And there is very little transparency about the decisions of making things secret. So that needs to be taken into account and changed. Uh, because all the secrecy in a digital reality with the internet uh, as it is, and how it's changed the way we uh, receive information, um, I think that governments uh, everywhere need to rethink the process of transparency and secrecy. And what do you think of the, I mean, there have been some pretty tempestuous things said about um, WikiLeaks, about Assange. I think one, you know, some commentator said he ought to be assassinated. There are people who think he ought to be arrested and put in jail for treason, that kind of thing. What do you think about that reaction? Well, uh, there was a high-ranking official in Canada that said that he should be assassinated. I don't think he was high-ranking. He was, well, well, he's an advisor to a high-ranking person. He used to be an advisor of the prime minister. He's a university professor now. Right. So he's not high-ranking. If you think university professors are high-ranking, then I guess he was <laughs> high-ranking. Well, well, anyway, uh, you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the, the American vice president said that uh, you could um, classify WikiLeaks as cyber-terrorist. Mm -hmm. And that is why I'm taking um, it, uh, thinking about the Twitter incident in a serious way, because um, as soon as they start to brand you as a terrorist, 
Uh, that means that they are going to be using all the terrorist legislation in the U.S., uh, which is, doesn't seem to have any boundaries. It's just a boundless uh, hunt for people, often based on very, very little evidence. So would you go to the United States today? Uh, no. You would not I, I, go? I have been advised by the Foreign Affairs uh, Ministry in Iceland not to do it, uh, and by lawyers in the United States. Um, I'm hoping to get it clarified from the United States diplomats in Iceland if it is safe for me to travel, uh, and particularly in my office as a parliamentarian. Okay, let's establish a fact or remind people of the fact that you're not with WikiLeaks anymore. You left. How yeah. come? Well, there are many, many different reasons. The main reason was uh, I felt that uh, WikiLeaks um, had I saw that it was going to explode, to become very big, and I felt that it needed uh, structures in place uh, for the volunteers um, and more transparency in relation to the financial aspect of it. Uh, and I tried to get a meeting for maybe two months uh, before I left to resolve that, and I couldn't. So, you know, if, if you try hard enough um, for a long time, it's no point trying, so you just either leave or get very depressed where well, you're working. Who, who, so. could, who would not give you a meeting? Well, I just wanted uh, to bring together all the different volunteers for WikiLeaks. Um, and they weren't interested? Well, Julian Assange at the time didn't feel that it was important. If he leaves the organization, is that the end of the organization? I don't know, because I haven't been part of it for a while, so I have no idea how it's structured now, so I, I can't really be much of a critic, and it's not my position to criticize them. So. Okay, so you're, you, all right, fair enough. You're not there anymore, but you were there uh, and did work with him. You worked closely with him, I think it's fair to say. Can you help us understand what skills he has that allow him to lead an organization that, you know, I think it, they've got the United States government, you know, running for cover here. What has he got? Well, he has... Um I would consider him to be a bit of a, well, he has a genius streak in him. Uh, and he is very good at, uh, he's sort of like um, a grandmaster chess player when he sets up um, his plans with uh, how to get maximum impact for his project. And it happens to be WikiLeaks now. Um, and I think that uh, he also has a lot of, uh, he's, it's easy for him to persuade people to do things with him. Um, is he a megalomaniac? I don't know. Does I wouldn't say that. Does he have delusions of grandeur? That's for others to judge. Okay. Um, does his personality ultimately hurt the organization more than help it? I don't know. It just remains to be seen. Uh, however, the good thing about what, and let's put things into focus, what WikiLeaks actually has done. Uh, and WikiLeaks is not only one person. It's always been many, many individuals. And Julian Assange, of course, is the person that brought this idea together and brought a lot of people together to work with him. Uh, so he, it is true that he is sort of the, the heart and soul of the organization. Um, however, what it did was to bring onto the agenda two very important issues. One is by making uh, whistleblowers, or the concept of whistleblowing, a household concept again, because people had sort of forgotten about that option. Uh, it has made uh, whistleblowing again an option for people, and we certainly do need a lot more whistleblowing, in, in particularly from the corporate sector. Well, let me ask whether or not what's happening in the United States, legally speaking right now, will have a chilling effect on all of that. And as you know, of course, they're subpoenaing your Twitter records, or trying to anyway. Uh, what do you make of that? It it's sort of feels to me as if uh, they've become quite desperate, uh, because uh, none of us that were subpoenaed, uh, there were five uh, individuals, or, you know, WikiLeaks as the organization, probably Julian, uh, through that, uh, Subpoenaed, all of us are very much aware of security issues. None of us would ever use Twitter messaging to say anything sensitive. Uh, and I don't really care if they get my Twitter feeds. I ha however, care if they get all the other material that they were requiring to get from us. Like what? Uh, they want uh, our IP numbers. They want, um, uh, and basically then to be able to track where one was at each time. Uh, 
and then they want uh, just a lot of personal information, uh, emails. Uh, Facebook? Well, I don't know about that yet. Uh, I'm waiting. Actually, I have to say that I'm very happy with Twitter and how they dealt with this. They actually fought for their clients, all of their clients. Uh, and um, by unsealing the sealed document, if they had not done that, we would never have known that they had submitted the material to the authorities. And so they gave us an opportunity to actually do something legally to stop it. And I, am, I don't really care about this information. I have nothing to hide. Uh, but I feel it is important to raise awareness about this because it is not only about me, but all the other users of social media. Is it, is it acceptable that governments can go into your uh, accounts like this and force uh, corporations to reveal your information? And just finally, Birgit, are you concerned that, I mean, you're, a, you're an Icelandic politician. You're a person with some standing in your home country. Are you concerned that if they start subpoenaing people like you, that uh, there will be a chill on whistleblowers all over the world? Yeah, I'm very concerned about that. I'm very concerned about the fact that they're trying to criminalize whistleblowing. It is not the crime to blow the whistle on war crimes. We're very grateful that you could spare some time for us today while you're visiting here in Canada. Thank you so much for joining us here on TVO tonight. Thank you for having me. Birgitta Jonsdottir, Icelandic Member of Parliament, former member of WikiLeaks.